Hey guys, it's Greg from Bic Album again, and as you may already know, I love playing with older hardware, or at least hardware that's relatively inexpensive to acquire. This includes things like older PCs that you can simply swap out the boot drive and graphics card to get a decent budging gaming rig, uh, Raspberry Pis which are super versatile and low powered, and even building PCs with hardware like this, the AMD Athlon 3000G. It was released in 2019 as an ultra low budget processor that can give you the bare minimum for gaming and such if you just need something cheap to get up and going. So let's see if it's any decent for, well, gaming, and if it's worth your money or not. You smell that? It smells like a bit goblin. Let's get right down to business. For an initial retail price of $50, you get a processor that has two cores, four threads, that have a base clock of 3.5 gigahertz, but no boost clock, so that 3.5 gigahertz is all you get without overclocking. And speaking of overclocking, it's based on AMD's 14 nanometer Zen 1 process node, which means that you're really not going to get a whole lot more out of this chip by doing so, since even the higher end Zen 1 chips hit a wall somewhere around 4.0, maybe 4.1 gigahertz, if you were lucky. And these definitely are not their higher bin chips, so don't count on getting too much out of that. But on a good note, this is also one of AMD's APUs, which means that it has one of their graphics chips built into it too. It uses AMD's Radeon Vega 3 graphics, which, while it's better than Intel's integrated graphics of that generation, admittedly it's really still not that great, and not really intended for gaming, with performance similar to that of like a GeForce GT430. Thus, we're not going to be testing that today, and we'll just be focusing on the processor and what you could get out of it when combined with a discrete GPU. Now you may remember the old AMD Athlon line of processors as being more on the order of like top tier performance and enthusiast chips from way back in the day. You know, what you'd consider Ryzen 9 or Core i9 chips right now. High clocks and great IPC for gaming, and able to be overclocked to squeeze every little bit of performance you could out of your budget. And you might be mistaken in thinking, oh well this is an AMD Athlon chip, so it should be somewhat in the top tier or at least close to top tier performance. But just looking at the specs, clearly this is not a top tier chip or even enthusiast level, and this is pretty much as low end as you can get. You you can't even get a Ryzen uh, three chip with uh, you can't even get a Ryzen three chip with only two cores. The minimum is four. So why does he get the Athlon name? My best guess is bringing back the Athlon branding was just one of those lame cash grabs of an old uh, beloved brand of years past, and less of an indication of performance or utility of the product. But regardless of the branding, we can still assess this fairly as a product in its own right. To be perfectly clear before we get into anything else, I'm not actually expecting for this to be competitive for gaming or anything. I just want to know if you can buy this and actually game with it if you're on an extremely low budget. And while there are other reviews done on it before, what's the fun in that? I like doing these things firsthand. So to run some tests with this chip, I use my usual test bench system with a GTX 1060 6GB GPU which is the best card I had on hand to test games with. Just like in my previous video on the Pentium G3258, I would have liked to have used a better card for this testing, and thus had to settle for using medium graphics settings across the board, but it'll be apparent very quickly that the 1060 was not at all a bottleneck for this chip. Moving on, numbers and charts are great and all, but before we actually get to the benchmarks, why don't we go over exactly how it's like using this for playing games? I'll be running a few games off of my test bench over there through video pass-through over to my desktop to record it, and I have my uh, mouse and keyboard over here to, you know, use to play the game. And it's not a setup I would recommend or encourage for playing games, but this should be a good enough setup to show how this actually performs while playing games. So right here I have Assassin's Creed Odyssey open. You can see in the top right corner I do have an FPS counter. I'm just going to wander around a little bit here, maybe uh, see if I can get some combat or whatever. Oh joy, look at this area load. Now I know that this is coming off a hard drive, so that's partially why these loading times are kind of gross, but I did not notice these uh, same like super long loading times while running on a different processor with the exact same hard drive. So even in between these pauses for loading the game, like you can still tell like the, the frame rate's really not the best. Like sure, we have the average up above 40 somewhere, which still it's not 60, but I would say that's at least playable, but you can still see like like little dips where like it kind of like, like micro stutters for a moment. So it's definitely not that great. And it is getting a little better now that we're like away from the city and there's not quite as many like things to like render and worry about. I would definitely not play like this. 
Let's see if I can find something really quick to fight in the, you know, see how combat is at least. So at least in combat, it, it is holding up somewhat decently. I, I'm not sure how it would hold up during the conquest battles that have like a ton of people fighting, but at least in these little uh, tiny battles, it's holding up somewhat decently. Okay, now we have Grand Theft Auto 5, and I should have mentioned it before last game, but I am running all these games at the same settings as the benchmarks that you'll see in a moment. But anyways, let's go ahead and start playing through this. So, you know, it's not having these like massive long pauses as things load. You can still see these like micro stutters as the game is playing. So I would definitely say this is for the most part playable. It's actually performing a lot better than I would have expected compared to the benchmarks, but it's how it goes sometimes, I guess. Excuse my driving skills. Uh, I'm definitely used to playing this on a controller. So in a car, it's definitely starting a little bit more, not terrible. Oh, did not see that coming. Car's finally on fire. Come on, explode. There we go. That's enough of that for now. But so far, I would say like Grand Theft Auto is at least somewhat playable. Um, it's not the best, but unlike Assassin's Creed Odyssey, like this is actually holding up somewhat decently as opposed to having like these really long pauses while it loads every three seconds. And finally, we're going to take a look at Borderlands 3. And uh, the reason I'm starting this in the intro is because this is not a very good look with just a black screen and claptrap loading, <laughs> and it's definitely uh, stuttering. So I guess now's a good time to point out that uh, while loading a lot of these games, uh, the game loading times were actually pretty terrible. And I, and I especially noticed this in uh, Assassin's Creed Odyssey. It's only a few years old, but this was particularly grueling during the benchmarking phase since loading the benchmark or even just going back to the main menu seemed like it took like five or 10 minutes just when using this chip. And you can see here with Borderlands 3, it's kind of taking a while too. Now again, these games are running off of a hard drive, so that's definitely part of the issue. But also again, when I ran this on the Ryzen 3600 XT, uh, the game loading times were a lot faster, so yeah. Okay, here we go. Uh, not a great start. It's The FPS counter, again, is, I guess, somewhat respectable, although it's, I do see it dipping below uh, 30 FPS. Um, and just kind of just walking around, it's definitely very stuttery. Let's see how it works for at least, like, killing something. Uh, there's another skag over here. Ooh, okay. When it gets a little bit crazy, I can definitely see it chugging a little bit. Now, I know part of my aiming issue is going through the external capture card, which is adding a little bit of delay there. When it starts chugging, it's definitely uh, throwing me off a lot. <laughs> I never realized it before, but this mouse is actually pretty loud. Okay, that's enough of that for now. Let's uh, get out of here. Okay, now that we're in a safe spot, like I can at least say for this, I guess at least compared to Assassin's Creed Odyssey, it's definitely a lot more playable. Um, I can actually like fight through people and not have too many issues. It's just it's a little jarring when like I like I'm shooting someone and then or trying to aim aim my gun and all of a sudden it just kind of like stutters a couple times while I'm trying to aim and it throws me off and yeah. It's playable if you can put up with it, but it's definitely not an experience I would recommend. So I guess the main point there is that even though my FPS counter was somewhat respectable, being somewhere between uh, 30 and 60 FPS, which to be clear is not great still, we were seeing a ton of chugging in the games, which indicates that we're having a ton of frames that are waiting on the CPU and our minimum frame rates are going to be a bit lower. Which goes to show that minimum frame rates are also very important when talking about the whole gaming experience. Granted, if you just wanted to play some older titles like Bioshock Infinite, for which you'll see benchmark results in a moment, or if you're like me and love to play old school RuneScape a lot, you'll do just fine then. Games of that level held up decently enough, but this can be limiting if you want to play newer games than from like 2013. And this is also not considering having anything extra open in the background other than Steam, so this would likely get a bit worse if you wanted to play some music or a YouTube video in the background while playing your games. All right now, don't worry. Just like any other hardware video, I have benchmarks. The benchmarks I used feature a couple synthetic benchmarks to get an objective measure of how the processor performs, some older and less CPU intensive games, and all the way up to some newer and more demanding games, just to get an idea of what level of gaming, if any, you're looking at with this chip. And like usual, I run my benchmarks three times and then average out the results to make sure what I'm seeing is consistent and I'm not getting some weird out of the park result because Windows 10 decided to do something random in the background. I also ran the benchmarks again on this chip with an overclock just in case you wanna go that route and try to squeeze every drop of performance you can out of it. And compared it all to a more mainstream chip, the Ryzen 3600 XT, which while it does cost significantly more for around $250 retail price, it is more what I would expect the average gamer to have, even though it's a little on the higher end. 
Anyways, we're off to the charts. So, as you could see from the results, the Athlon 3000G couldn't really keep up in terms of gaming performance, with a lot of games not only getting a decent boost to their average frame rates when going to the 3600 XT, but also a substantial improvement to their minimum FPS, which like I mentioned earlier, is rather important to a smooth feeling gaming experience. And I also feel it's important to mention here that some games like Grand Theft Auto V and Rise of the Tomb Raider, for instance, had wildly varying minimum frame rates jumping from 3 to 14 in GTA, and then around 14 to 34 in Rise of the Tomb Raider. And yes, I know that these canned benchmarks aren't exactly indicative of real-world performance, but they're still good for comparison sakes. And I reran these benchmarks several times, but no matter how many times I ran them, I kept getting at least one run that varied a lot compared to the others, so I just went with my original set of results for those games. Now you could just bump up the graphic settings a step or two higher to get the GPU more in line with the Athlon, and I would, I would actually suggest that for the older or less demanding titles like Bioshock or Deus Ex. But doing that for some of the newer games like Assassin's Creed Odyssey or even the old Grand Theft Auto V still wouldn't yield a good experience. And honestly, it's pretty telling that this chip is bottlenecking this GPU. The 1060 really wasn't that high end of a graphics card when it was released, being more targeted at a mainstream audience in the $250 to $300 range. And considering that it's still the most popular GPU, at least according to the Steam hardware survey, and still plenty more are using better ones, this wouldn't really be suitable for a lot of people. And one more thing I would like to mention here is just the overall usability of the system with this chip, since things like booting up Windows and opening up Steam and even just simply closing games felt sluggish. This isn't easily quantifiable without taking a stopwatch to and manually timing these actions. And it's also a little finicky to control, making sure Windows isn't doing some other BS in the background. But regardless of whatever is going on, this chip hits the struggle bus pretty hard when pretty much anything needs to use the processor. And swapping over to the Ryzen 3600 XT for testing was a huge breath of fresh air, not feeling like I could make a cup of coffee every time I wanted to do something. So now for the conclusion, is this a good value? Strictly speaking, no. At $75 or more on the used market, it's an increase of 50% plus compared to the retail value of $50 for this chip. So unfortunately, even though it's not exactly new anymore and not great for, well, a lot of things, you're still stuck paying a king's ransom for it, relatively speaking. Now, one benefit this does have over any processor older than 2nd gen Ryzen and I think 8th gen Intel CPUs is that this actually does have official support for Windows 11 and it will pass the checks in the PC, PC Health Check app once you've enabled TPM in your mother, motherboard's BIOS. But if you're going that route, I would then argue you should go for something like the Ryzen 1200 AF, which if you're looking at pricing on Amazon, for instance, you can find one for merely $40 to $45 more and will perform pretty much the same, if not better, in single-threaded tasks because it is based on AMD's Zen Plus Silicon, which has a slightly improved IPC, and it actually has boost clocks, which this Athlon chip doesn't. Plus, it also has four real cores instead of just a measly two. Now, of course, the market is still very volatile as we're still in the middle of massive supply shortages that have been affecting, well, pretty much everything, so prices can and have been changing week to week. I mean, heck, the aforementioned Ryzen 1200 AF processor was actually about $20, $30 cheaper on Amazon about a week or two ago. Plus, you add in the fact that AMD and even Intel haven't released any new lower-end chips on their latest lineups, this forces budget PC buyers to go to last gen to find any suitable chips. And even then, at least on AMD's side, the supply constraints have been affecting the Ryzen 3100 and 3300X chips pretty much since the release a little over a year and a half ago. 
So if you're in this crowd, you're pretty much stuck going for one of the lower end APUs like the 3200 or 3400G, which again are hard to find for a good price. You can go for this crappy Athlon chip if you really, really need something, or hope you can find a deal for something like an older Intel chip or the aforementioned Ryzen 1200AF, which would not only provide you better performance in games, but would also give you a much better overall experience in day-to-day -day usage. And if you're curious about the performance of that chip, you can go check out Gamers Nexus's benchmarks for reference. It's hard to predict when, if ever, things will return to the way they were prior to this mess, and any estimates given by Intel or AMD or whoever are hard to believe since we've heard plenty of times before and they have come and gone without any change. Also consider the fact that we're getting into the holiday season, and even though processors haven't been affected nearly as much as GPUs, you can still look through Amazon and a lot of the more, more popular mainstream options are out of stock pretty much everywhere, or you can find them for, you know, much higher prices. Now, of course, that's not to say that you should give in and pay these exorbitant prices to scalpers and anyone else looking to take advantage of the situation. I just mean that waiting it out isn't always feasible in the long term if, say, your CPU dies, which unfortunately it does happen. And if you do decide to bite the bullet and just want something to get you by for the time being, then I would try to scrounge together another $40 or so to go with the Ryzen 1200 AF if you must go AMD or see if you can find like a recent-ish Intel Core i3 processor, like the Core i3-10100F, which goes for around $90 these days. Since either of those chips will give you a much better overall experience, it will likely last you a lot longer into the future before you need to upgrade again. Anyways, that's all I have for this one, and if you didn't like the video, then you know what to do. But if you did like it, then go click that button and go get subscribed, and click the bell icon so you don't miss future videos just like this one. Also, feel free to leave your feedback on this video or suggestions for future videos in the comment section below. I'm always glad to hear from you all about mistakes I've made or for new video ideas. I've also got a Discord server if you'd like to join the community and hang out and chat or whatever. And there's also several channels to get help with whatever tech problems you have. I hope you all have a great day and I will catch you in the next one.